This podcast is presented by the Verizon Partner Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the podcast brought to you by the Verizon Partner Network. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B. And folks, thank you so much for joining us on another episode of the show. We appreciate you listening along as we continue to unpack major and important trends in our industry. Today, I'm excited to chat high level about a business term that is catching wind and fire in our industry and that we are taking to heart for future growth and innovation. Now, before I reveal what that term is and what the topic of conversation today is going to be, I want to make sure you're all caught up with previous episodes of the show, as well as other important resources from the Verizon team. So make sure that you're heading to our website, Verizon dot com slash business. Again, that's verizon.com slash business for more information on our solutions and services, of course, for more episodes of the podcast and for other research and resources. And you can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Just hit that subscribe button and you'll have a full catalog of previous conversations plus notifications when we drop new episodes. So today we're going to be getting to the meat of a buzzy business term that's been around for a while now. It's not necessarily new. It has plenty of examples in practice in recent years from VMware and AWS to Pfizer and BioNTech. But the reason we're bringing it up today is that it's been growing in popularity, especially as industry at large still tries to find its footing after two years of economic disruptions. So what is this mysterious term I keep bringing up? Well, it is co-opetition, right? Co-opetition, cooperation plus competition, co-opetition. So this was coined in 1996 by a Harvard and Yale professor, and it's the formal strategy of, uh, again, co-opetition that embraces game theory and says that businesses can actually gain strategic advantages through interdependency, through collaboration, and uh, doing all of this with competing firms, naturally, with other players who they may have previously called um, competition in their marketplace. So the concept may seem foreign to the classic tenets of our competitive market economy, where cooperation amongst major players in an industry might feel counterintuitive or counterproductive. But in fact, it has seen and has been proven to be a strategy for business growth and for elevating an entire industry's capacity. So with today's episode, we're going to hear about how coopetition works in a competitive market. We're also going to discover some strategies on when to cooperate, when to compete, when to collaborate. And additionally, you're going to learn the role of a company's credo and how that plays a role in driving results for the business and why uh, unifying that with the strategy of coopetition could prove beneficial. We'll also give some examples for how Verizon is embodying this spirit of coopetition. So I'm pleased to welcome our three guests today from the Verizon team. We'll go down the line. First up, Dave Hickey. He's Vice President of Business Sales. Dave, great to have you on. How are you doing? Daniel, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here and uh, really talk through, I think that buzzword is for sure. I, I know uh, when we first started talking about it, I was like, what, what is this completely? And I'm like, oh, I, I deal with this every single day. Um, but yeah, I've, uh, a little bit about me. I've been um, with Verizon for 20 plus years, handling small and medium enterprise government customers. Today, I'm the vice president of business sales and focused mostly on small and medium uh, businesses. I handle uh, half of the country. Uh, a lot of those flyover states as well, which is awesome, and um, just excited to be with you guys today and share some of maybe the some of the insights that I've gleaned over the years, and and uh, hope those will help out. And it's a real pleasure getting to pick your brain today on this topic, and thank you again for joining us on the podcast. Uh, next up, we're joined by Arlene Couchy. She's a partner for business development at Verizon. Arlene, great to have you on. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. So, um, yeah, my background is I work with uh, our partner ecosystem, both system integrators, as well as hardware and software uh, partners. And that is on a global basis. And it's all about us learning how to work together to serve the customer more. And um, I live out here on the, the West Coast. Um, but however, I originally came from one of those flyover states, David. Um, 
And, but uh, my background, I, I tell everybody it's a smorgasbord. So I have worked for startups and I have worked up for huge companies like Verizon and everything in between. And I have worked as a, started out as an engineer and I've worked in product management and sales and business development. I've also been selling um, services, hardware, professional services, um, software, kind of you name it, I've done it. Um, so that's my smorgasbord. Well, I appreciate you pulling from that smorgasbord for our conversation today. So thank you again for joining us. And last but not least, we're joined by Sarah Marsh. She's Director of Channel Enablement at Verizon. Sarah, great to have you on. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm great and really excited to be a part of this conversation today. So similar to Dave, I've spent uh, the majority of my career here at Verizon, and I had about a decade of B2B sales leadership roles before moving into the channel. So now I support a huge ecosystem of very diverse set of partners. We have over 5,000 that are a part of the Verizon Partner Network. Um, so obviously it's it's a huge opportunity for a lot of co-opetition across this really diverse partner community. So really excited to talk about it with everyone today. Absolutely. So again, David, Arlene, and Sarah, thanks for your time. And let's jump into it, right? So I just want to make sure our audience really understands what we're talking about, right? So what do we mean when we say co-opetition? Kind of already described it, but just as a quick refresher, depending on the circle you run in, right, this may not be a familiar or even a mainstream strategy. Uh, it's again the combination of cooperation and competition in a way that really emphasizes a partnership between two entities that may otherwise be competitors. But obviously in that partnership, not forgetting that even you know, within it, you know, they're still competing entities and independent entities to some regard. So it really is that interdependency and that quid pro quo and seeing how can we both meet our internal needs by assisting each other in a uh, group vision. So I'm curious then, you know, nearly 30 years after this was formalized by those two professors I mentioned earlier, how are y'all seeing this term manifesting in business today? And if you had to maybe compare contrast, how does coopetition look different today than it did in 1996? Well, I actually think it's more relevant than ever because business uh, challenges are getting much more complex. Um, so I mentioned, you know, we have a broad ecosystem of partners here at Verizon as a part of the Verizon Partner Network. Um, many of these companies that we work with are considered competitors in some instances, but then they're partners in others. And if you think about all of the broad capabilities that these companies can bring to the table um, from a solution delivery standpoint, from a distribution standpoint, there's so many benefits that we can bring together to a customer and really address market needs in new and different ways. Um, so really it's a competitive advantage if you can really lean into a, an ecosystem and really think about how you can serve customers in different ways and how can you respond to market needs. Um, so by working together, we can really develop unique solutions. Um, we can be much more agile in how we respond to market needs. And then we can really meet customers where and when they want to buy. Just kind of, highlighting how you started that, Sarah, you talked about uh, really understanding how you can serve the customer more. And I do think that's the the driving force of why we have this co-opetition. But to really make it be successful, I think the two partners need to align on the why. Why are the why are these partners coming together? And why does it make more sense for us to work together versus to work in our silos apart? And if we really can get that right, the why, the partnership will take off because there's gonna be a, a natural attraction of the two partners to work together. You know, in general, it's usually about together we can make the pie bigger Together, we've got more to go after. Together, we can win more. And one plus one equals three. Um, but that's, I think, the critical piece to get the sales teams, the marketing teams, the engineer teams, all the teams that are critical for that partnership to work together is that clear understanding of why one plus one equals three and what that value proposition is for both organizations. 
Yeah, I, I love what Arlene said. And Sarah, and maybe just to build on that is um, we've really seen our ability to get out of our own world or get out of our own way um, really come to light. And so, you know, I think there's been a lot happen over the last few years. Um, clearly the pandemic, um, the way in which we get maybe go to market with some of our um you know, the, the competition that's out there today. And some of them, some of our competition is in the spotlight and some of them are behind the scenes that others may not know about. And so we've had to really look at what's the greater good, like what, what can we actually do and move forward? And does that pave the path? Is it, is it going to help both entities move forward? And I love it. I mean, um, we'll, you know, you will talk about more of this later as well, but you think about the pandemic, you think in our world, we try to secure sites to be able to bring amazing networks to our customers every single day. There's only sometimes so many sites based on the land. And so we uh, will work with our competition sometimes on co-locating sites. There's also municipalities we're working with. There's a lot of things that I think that in the past we may have not done. And now we know it's just a way to do great business. And so uh, I'm excited to know that we have found a way to get out of our way is the best way to say it. Uh, and really move forward as well. Yeah, and I love the way you said, get out of our way, because at the end of the day, I think we're all focused on the outcome, the business outcome, and what's the best thing for the customer. And if we can all focus on that, it really is that one plus one equals three that you mentioned, Arlene. So, um, you know, I think a lot about the way we bundle solutions, the way we can deliver things that are really, um, you know, incremental to the value we'd be able to bring to a customer on our own. So. It is really exciting when you take a step back and you really focus on, you know, the end result and the business outcome and what's possible when you're working together. Yeah, it's huge. And, you know, just to tie in some more specific examples as, uh, you know, somewhat of an outsider to the co-opetition world, when I think of these collaborative scenarios, um, I can't help but look at the COVID-19 response, for example. Uh, you know, I think we saw co-opetition not only among you know, several countries at a macro level working together, sharing research to develop their own proprietary COVID vaccines that would then be spread on a global market. But we also saw coopetition among companies themselves, more applicable to our conversation today, like uh, Pfizer and BioNTech, which placed, you know, some of the overlapping parts of their business models aside to develop a vaccine. Uh, perhaps an even more acute example would be pharmaceutical giants uh, Sanofi and GlaxoSmithKline, which were direct competitors across French and British markets. They dropped those short-term competitive motivators to collaborate on a vaccine. So this is happening in real time. It's happening for uh, you know mission critical reasons. And what's exciting, and what I hope y'all can um, you know follow up on here for me, is that more and more research in different industries is showing the benefits of coopetition. Um, businesses are able to share their strengths, distribute workloads, uh, compete against even larger competitors, right? Uh, kind of bundle up the underdogs. Uh, they're able to improve market performance, foster innovation, establish industry standards through this collaboration, all by knocking heads together and still maintaining that independence, but making it an interdependent success strategy. So uh, I'm curious then if you have any other examples that stand out to y'all either related to the industries that you serve or just anecdotally at large that you think really highlight the efficacy of this method or showcase why it's so impactful in practice. Yeah, I, I'm, maybe I'll hit a couple. I think uh, just think about the devices that we use every single day um, and what the OEMs out there, the manufacturers have been able to do and and us as um, the operators to go out and sell, like we're clearly coming to them with similar needs and talking about here are the things that we want in our device. Here's how we want it to be functional. Here's what it will enable. And that could come through hardware or software um, that's out there. And so to see um, us come together on our side and then also the OEMs collaborate on bringing that to fruition. And that could be a device. Um, think about into the car industry and what's happening with that and how it's really propelling forward and we'll be in this self-driving world before you know it. Um, and so those sort of things I think are absolutely significant and have been able to pave the way for us within Verizon and enable solutions. And we even sell inside Verizon, we sell solutions that compete with the solution that we may offer as our own product. And because we know the best thing we can do is offer choice. 
Um, and there may be a feature or a subset or something within that I think is massive, but it's been great to sit in this seat and see not only in the business side, but Daniel, what you hit from how we as just citizens of this great country, what we benefit from it as well. And so healthcare, that perspective, what you brought with COVID-19, think about what we're doing with space exploration and all the other things that take place. It's pretty great to uh, have a maybe a backseat here a little bit and see how as a world we can come together and really solve problems massively quick. Just to um, elaborate on that a little bit too about choice, we have a pretty large partner ecosystem of both you know hardware and software products that that we leverage as kind of the foundation for our network. And what's nice is many of our customers use many of those partners within um, our partner ecosystem. And our ability to be that one-stop shop and to bring in all these partners and help them work together, which normally a lot of these partners are competing head to head with each other. So we kind of provide that unity, if you will, and, and provide a better customer experience by creating that kind of partner ecosystem for our customers. Yeah, I, I'd love to um, just agree with that point, Arlene, because I think what it really does is it simplifies the experience for customers and it really helps them to realize the full value of all those individual components or parts they might get from individual companies. Um, but by bringing it together and really tapping into the, the power of an ecosystem, it really adds incremental value for the customer at, mm -hmm. at the end of it too. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I want to follow up on that um, core sentiment there, Arlene, because I think it reflects Verizon's um, credo very well, right? It's, it's ethos and it, it's, its core vision. Um, naturally, many organizations harness a unique set of principles that can help guide them and their behavior and their business decisions. And for employees at Verizon, this code is referred to as your credo. Uh, so there's a line in the credo that I think lines up perfectly with the mission of co-opetition. So I'll, I'll read it out for our audience. The line says, quote, our competitors are not our enemies. They are challengers who drive us to improve, end quote. So I, I think that's, I mean, like I couldn't think of a, a better just one sentence summary that aligns a business vision with co-opetition. But I'm curious how you see that playing out in practice, right? How do you all see that manifest as Verizon pursues its own co-opetition strategies? And also, like you said, Arlene, acts almost as a touch point between various partners. Yeah, so I, I would say driving us to improve continues to, to force us to figure out how we can improve the customer experience. How can we better meet the needs of the customer? And that's really driving us to have relevant partnerships and strong partnerships so that we can deliver business outcomes. That's really what's important to our customer is that we can, on the factory floor, reduce scrap or improve employee safety. In the hospital, we can help them improve patient care or home care. Uh, at retail outlets, we can help them improve the customer experience. So it's all about enabling connectivity for that business outcome. And so we're with our partners looking to provide that connected hospital, that connected factory floor, that connected warehouse, that connected retail store. And the, you know, the examples go on and on. And to really deliver on that, we need it to address an end-to-end -end solution. And leveraging our partners' vertical expertise and their technical expertise can help us deliver that end-to-end -end solution which is really what our customers are looking for. Yeah, I um, I love that line in the credo. Um, I think it's I think it's awesome. It defines us. There's another one within the credo that says teamwork enables us to serve our customers better and faster. Mm -hmm. And so, Daniel, that that not only applies internally but externally um, as well. And and um, there's a lot that happens within Sarah's group um, as well that we partner on a lot of initiatives. But we also just look at how can we do business? How do we do business more efficiently? And then we also look at ways in which we can respond to market feedback. Right now, it's about customers are looking for reliable, faster data. 
right? And, and you think about that. That used to be a lot of us in office. How do I get the Wi-Fi and the space faster? But now office is everywhere, right? And so whether we're like today, we're in offices, we're in homes, we're all over the place. And so we're looking for that uh, ability to enable hybrid products that can be in a person's home, but offer really business grade services out there today. And that redefines how we work. Um, and so I, I think there's no way, if you take off what Arlene just said, that end to end solution, you don't do that by yourself. Um, you just can't, or you won't be able to do it at scale by yourself. And I, so I, I think of that as, as massive approach to us. And so we want to make sure at Verizon that we give the uh, customer a customized approach that's going to work for them regardless of their environment. And we know that competition enables that for us. Yeah, and, and we've had so many examples of really unique, really customized solutions that we've been able to deploy um, and very quickly too. And if you think about, you know, Verizon's a massive organization and we have a best in class product organization that's launching amazing products for customers. But when you tap into the full potential of this partner ecosystem and all of these unique capabilities that they have, we're able to respond to the needs of the market so quickly. Um, and we talked about the pandemic, and this, I think, is a great example. You know, everyone's world was turned upside down, and we had to all of a sudden work from home and teach our kids at home, and businesses had to change the way that they served their customers um, overnight. And so we tapped into our partner network to um, launch some new solutions to help enable customers do just that. And we were able to launch um, almost 20 different solutions tailored just to help businesses stay afloat and adapt and meet the needs of their customers in this really, uh, really challenging time at the beginning of the pandemic very quickly because we had the agility of much smaller um, partner organizations behind us really being innovative and thinking differently. So not only were we enabling um, businesses to get to home and students to get to home, but also launching um, for retailers, you know, drive, drive through or pick up options um, sensoring, uh, thermal imaging, and temperature monitoring, so many different solutions that customers didn't even know they needed pre-pandemic. Um, and luckily with the power of our partner network, we were able to collaborate um, and launch these really unique solutions so quickly within a matter of weeks to make sure businesses had everything they need to stay afloat during a really challenging time. So I think there's a really great example of how they can lean in, help us get very customized and stay very, very agile as well. You know, Sarah, on that earlier, I was talking about one plus one needs to equal three and that you need to really identify what's the value to each partner to, for this partnership. To what, to kind of take that into the direction you were just talking about, one plus one needs to equal three for the customer as well. Mm -hmm. So they need to understand, you know, why, why do I want to understand this partnership versus working with you separately? And what is it that you're offering me that's different because you're coming together? And I think in the end, there are many reasons that we can deliver unique solutions, but also what it allows us to do is really help the customer feel more confident in, in the solution because they see us working together as a partner. They know that we have uh, tested the solution. We probably have reference architectures around the solution. Um, we A lot of these things we showcase in our labs so our customers can come in and see how we're working together. And so it's not about our customer putting together a science experiment. Um, it's actually about them getting the full benefit of a solution through this partnership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I maybe just one last comment in there. I think of the many partners that we've worked with, um, and I'm Daniel, you've probably seen this throughout your years, that are small. Um, they're a four to six person shop maybe, and they just wouldn't have the resources or scalability to get their amazing service or product out uh, to the masses. And so when they get to work through Sarah's partner network or directly through Verizon, um, it's a great solution for the customer, but it's a win-win. Now this amazing um, individual or individuals put together their product and service, had no idea they could get it to millions. And now they use this partner network. 
um, it's wet. And so, you know, again, one of those things I just have a ton of pride as you look back at Verizon and how they've been able to enable success. The America is built on SMB. And so small business America is huge. And so to see that happen through this network and the ability for us to take off the, uh, I'm not going to work with them because they do something similar to what I do has really enabled that as well, which has really been awesome. Uh, I love all your answers there. And um, I guess as a follow-up point, you know, there's an ethos that really speaks to me here. I think this shines a clear light on how individual human mo uh, motivators, excuse me, are, are really set by the conditions that they're placed in, right? There's always this nature versus nurture argument when we talk about um, you know, market competition or collaboration. And I think proponents of cooperation would agree hopefully, that pure, unbridled individual competition isn't necessarily the way things always have to be, right? There is a case for something else. When people are conditioned and, and see the results of how their decisions affect others in this kind of context, uh, and when that interdependence is shown to be valuable for the individual, but also for a, a, a larger communal business goal, a shared set of interests and goals that create a positive feedback loop of success, uh, you know, I think that value of collaborative competition becomes very clear. And as we know, every market at least should have healthy competition, right? That's sort of a, a core tenet of how we expect our competitive market economy to work. Uh, and that's supposed to give businesses and consumers plenty of options to choose from, which in turn drives price and quality. Um, so I, I want to hone in there, right? Because without market competition, we would experience the effect of monopolies, which, uh, you know, something that we do experience. It's a very timely and present challenge in several industries. High prices, few options. It keeps out smaller businesses and makes markets uh, inaccessible or unsustainable for consumers. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm curious what you see as likely to happen when businesses don't cooperate, right? Because I, uh, I think we're we're really encouraging businesses out there to take on this challenge and to. Uh, you know, I don't know, work with folks who maybe they uh, had once plotted against, right? Uh, and so uh, crossing that hurdle and building that sort of interdependence can still seem foreign. So let's make a case on the other end, right? What is likely to happen if you don't cooperate as a business? What are some of the consequences that you see play out when cooperation is um, not embraced or actively ignored? Yeah. Um, I, it's a, it's a great question. And unfortunately we've seen that play out over the years of some really, uh, large companies that were once the dominant power and I think didn't do anything. And, and unfortunately they're, they're either not in business or not in business the way they were. I, I think it without competition, um, you don't stay relevant. Your, your product lineup potentially. Uh, become stagnant. The way in which you approach and at the end of the day, take care of your customer um, probably isn't a 10 out of 10. Um, and so you don't do what you're, I think, required to do. When competition means Brit, you have to bring your best foot forward. And, uh, and that's not just price. That is value in the product and the solution and how you interact with them. And I think that's big. And I think um, one example of that is just think about the digital uh, transformation that's taking place. The number of customers that pre-pandemic would never have went online and bought everything that they do to now post, I'll, I'll call it post-pandemic, um, <laughs> post where we were, um, what they're able to do now. You've got people in all age classes that are going on and using our uh, Verizon business service, whether that um, is directly or indirectly to manage everything about their account, how they engage with their rep, how they work with our customer service, how they order products and services, and how they make changes. And so what we've had to do is adapt how we empower them um, and give them the actual resources to do it. And I think if you don't do that, you keep the old business model and you keep working about how many people are coming in and out of doors if you're in the consumer front. And I think that is absolutely, I think the other part is um, just making sure internally, if you don't have competition, you probably don't look at elements where you say that requires change now and what resources I'm going to put around it. Um, because either the competition does it better than you or the, um, the masses ask for it. Um, but you have to look and decide if your bottom line allows you to do it. And so I think there's been a lot of gaps out there as well that we've had to go and try to address and ensure 
that we stay ahead of that. And I can tell you, um, our, our CEO on the business side, Tammy Irwin, has really pushed us to make sure that we're proactive and that we're finding ways and uh, um, pathways to do business better with our customers to ensure that they're at the center of what our request is and ensure that we don't become one of those legacy entities that potentially thought we were better than we are and not willing to change. Competition keeps us in check. And so I, I would say that's one area uh, that we want to do. And then this, the, the second one, and I'll close on that one, is like um, there's a lot of things we do internally with Verizon, too, and from a volunteer perspective. And some of those things are side by side with your competition um, and you're going through it. It's been a really cool thing to be able to see people have the same genuine interest to go after it. Um, and so you get to see them in both sides of it as well. But we have a ton of employees and we've got these amazing factors where we are of a society pillar where we're out there working towards similar goals to take care of our great nation and great world. And uh, that's another thing that I think competition allows us to see who's doing what and the why behind it that we jump into the same part. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up the society impact too, Dave, because I think that is so significant. And, you know, despite being competitors, so many businesses, I think, have the same values. Um, and want to make the same impact on the world around us. So, you know, we think about education as an example, um, you know, and we talked a lot today about the, the pandemic and the impact that that's had on our world. Um, I mean, especially the education sector and how it's disrupted our education systems across the world. Um, you know, it's it's been very dramatic. I mean, many of us have been teaching our kids part-time for the last two years or full-time for part of it. Um, but think about, some other, you know, underserved communities and the rural communities that don't have broadband access. Um, and that's an area where we really leaned in as a business at, at Verizon. You know, we pledged a uh, billion dollars to expand rural broadband, launched a number of programs um, and discounts, um, you know, to really help close that digital divide uh, because there's millions of students who are learning from home or have been learning from home over the last two years without that broadband access. Um, and it's really, really brought to light uh, what a significant problem the digital divide is. And our competitors are investing similarly and doing similar programs um, as well. So think about the impacts that we can all make together. And it's so much more significant when we come together around such an important issue um, and really work towards a common mission. So it, it really, I think, highlights uh, that we can just we can be better together um, and we can really impact the world in, in a much more significant way when we do that. And just leaning into that a little bit, we're actually having the same conversations with our customers as well, right? The things that are important to Verizon are also important causes for our customers. And, and they're looking for, um, you know, like-minded, um, you know, partners and vendors and suppliers and the list goes on and on. So really sharing that common cause, um, it's just another way to kind of connect um, beyond the business outcome. So I think that was, I think that was a great um, highlight. Now, I also want to highlight uh, and I guess further expand on what y'all have been talking about here, which is some of the opportunities that come with co-opetition uh, because there are, you know, um, focused reasons to embrace this, not only, you know, for those high level, um, you know, sort of uh, business ethos reasons, but also because there is ROI, right? Naturally, it has to be tied to some kind of business strategy, to business models and decisions. And that really does bear out in these strategies. Uh, in many ways, building these strategic partnerships with competition in the market also helps build protection against some internal and external forces that can hurt the progress and growth of a business. So it can protect against things like power imbalances, lack of trust between partners and customers even. Um, it can protect against inefficient workflows, against potential loss of competitive advantages. It can also help protect against antitrust issues, right? Um, but naturally, no one strategy is always a one-size-fits-all. So I want to get into the nuances here with y'all. How should businesses learn the signs of when to compete when to cooperate and when to coopetate, I think is how I saw it, <laughs> to verbify coopetition. Um, whoever wants to jump in there first. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll share my thought, just a, a quick uh, points. I think you definitely have to understand the situation and the scenario um, and really looking at it. And I, I like how you said, what are the signs there? And I don't think there, I wish there was a red light, green light. There isn't some, they're like really, really obvious to get out there. But you got to really look at where you're trying to maximize, right? There's the gain side of it. There's the margin side of it. There's the profit side of it. But there is the total landscape of the deal and whatever that may be. And you may find that you on your own is completely fine and you're going to win. But I think you got to use that win percentage as you think about the leadership side of it. What's the probability I'm going to win solo versus what's the probability I'm going to win with a partner? which could also be the competition. And so I think we take that into perspective all the time on what's the bet likelihood that we're going to win. And win means I, the customer loves my solution and right, and then I get the deal. Those are, that's two-sided there as, as I work through it. And there's a lot of examples of that, that we can go back to it and work through it. And I think there's a ton of partnership sides as well. Um, you know, there's all this stuff around the buzz around 5G and the networks that that's bringing. And um, we're, we're excited for it. It's really next generation for us to what it enables um, as well. And so I think 5G as a buzzword is, is out there and there's a ton of confusion in the marketplace on what that actually means. Um, but I would tell you, there's a lot of stuff that you've, you've heard about the meta technologies and what people are doing and what that's going to enable. And you know, I think we probably have no idea, but there's all these futuristic movies you can go watch and you're like, I don't know if that's going to be real um, that's out there. But I think the how we will be connected, how you're looking at what metaverse will bring with immersive and interconnected technologies and how that may enable us to serve customers better and faster as well is really interesting. So I think you've got to think of not only what you're doing now, but what's that future scape look like? which is why we've enabled 5G, which is why we invested in C-band, which is why we have edge technology that's going to allow all these companies out there that are building the metaverse really run on an amazing net network. And you know we clearly want to be the network of choice in that scenario. But I think those are just a couple of them out there um, that I can think of. And then maybe one last one is we, uh, right at the start of the pandemic, and it was just great timing as we acquired blue jeans. And so, you know, all of a sudden the need for an amazing service that you can go and deploy up and have video conferencing every single day just happened to, you know, fall into our laps. I'm kidding. Like that was clearly working in for years in the process. But a service like that, Daniel, is something that it was either we were going to have to partner with somebody to go do it or enable it on our network and Verizonize it. And I think that's been a great example of all the remarkable services. Blue Jeans has now brought telehealth to another level um, as well. So those are just a few things that come to mind, I think that you've got to think about, and then also that some of the outcomes of when you do it. I know it's interesting you said this, what's the signal, what's the sign? And um, I, I, David, I wish there was a red light, green light, don't you? It would be so nice. <laughs> I don't know if there's a sign, but I, I'll go back to what I said earlier. I think the math equation needs to be there. I think one plus one needs to equal three. And so one plus one needs to equal three for each partner and one plus one needs to equal three for the customer as well. And I'm kind of, you know, repeating what I said earlier, but I do think that's foundational to why why you're drawn to one another and why the customer appreciates that partnership. And I think on that note, we'll uh, go ahead and wrap up because yeah, I, I think you're right. If there was, if there was the one sort of, um, I don't know, test stick, right? That you could just put in the water and check the pH balance but for co cooperation or competition and then move forward, then um, things would be a little too easy, right? And so I, I think it really comes down to listening to uh, your partners, identifying areas where there can be that mutually beneficial uh, business strategy. But then, yeah, like y'all said, it's really got to come down to the numbers. If it adds up, if there is a business case that shows individually both businesses can move forward with this partnership and see growth, but also that 
it is because of that interdependence, then I think it builds this snowball effect where uh, it, you know, it validates itself because of the partnership, and then the partnership then further validates more collaboration, more coopetition, uh, and I think that's beneficial for every industry. So, folks, I, I really appreciate y'all joining us and giving us your perspectives on the podcast today. Uh, any final thoughts from each of you to close things out for our audience? I'll start. I'll just uh, re-emphasize. I think there's just tremendous value when you think about an ecosystem um, and really tapping into the full potential of a partner ecosystem. You know, with the unique capabilities, the ability to customize for customers, and really deliver solutions in a unique way. Um, it's it's such a huge opportunity to go to market. Um, quickly to be agile and to really customize the way that customers receive solutions. Um, it brings a tremendous amount of value to Arlene's point across the board for all the companies that work together in that ecosystem. But ultimately, it's really the value proposition to the customer and really meeting them how they want to buy, where they want to buy, and really simplifying it for them by coming together and delivering it jointly. I'll I'll just expand on one point that you made, which was around, you know, being able to be quick to market. Mm -hmm. I do think that's important for the partnership as well. So you, you bring these partners together, they're excited to work together. There's this energy there and to really make sure you tap in on that energy. You have to get quickly from, Hey, I think we should partner. Hey, I have an idea to actually delivering it to the customer and having a, a conversation with the customer to validate this partnership. So I think Ver Verizon's put together a framework for how we do that. How do we get from, we got an idea to talking to the customer. And we, I think we've gotten very good at innovating with our customers and doing it in a very fast manner. Yeah, I think both well said. I, I, where I'll be additive here is I think um, as we look at what we've done thus far, and um, Sarah and I both talked about we've been with Verizon for a long time, so we've seen grow in the technologies that are being enabled, and it's just getting faster and faster, and our reliance on type of network and technology is just going to grow in a very, very heavily connected world. And I know, and I'm sure people that are listening to this know that the ability for us to do those things quicker and faster and more efficient is critical to business success. And that means some of the things that we've said today about being able to determine when it's best to partner, I think is really big. And also the unique solution that you may bring, how does that really work in the entire ecosystem? Um, and so I know that that's absolutely what we're doing internally in Verizon. We've invested a lot in networks and building up with C-Band to ensure that we bring an amazing technology to our customers. But that's the network side of it. Everything that we're going to work with partners um, through the groups that we've talked about today is all going to be built on top of that network. And that requires us to be able to have open eyes and open minded to what that may come because what we kind of understand today i think we've got a good uh, grasp on that and we're going to be solving for it but there's companies that are going to stand up in the next year that are going to be different and they're going to be able to help us um, in that way and they may be labeled as i said earlier in that group of it may be small but competition and we'll continue i know uh with the great leadership we have here at verizon to continue to look for ways to partner and so i'm excited for what that may be i don't know what it is i just know where it's going to grow and it's going to grow in a great way And since there's so much growth to look forward to, we'll definitely be having y'all back on in the future, I imagine, to um, you know further break down how y'all's cooperation strategies are working for Verizon, how they're working for your partners, um, but then get a pulse on this trend. Because like we mentioned at the top of the podcast, uh, it's picking up steam and relevancy in today's market. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty in a lot of industries about what tomorrow looks like, what the next quarter looks like, what the next year looks like. And I think rethinking, you know, does our strategy have to be solely competitive might be a good place to start. There might be some partners out there who would benefit from, you know, you picking up that phone, making that call and developing that co-opetition strategy. Could be beneficial for both of y'all, could be beneficial for the whole industry. 
So with that, we'll wrap things up. Thank you again to the three of you for your perspectives you. today. We'll go down the line again. We've been joined today by Dave Hickey, Vice President of Business Sales, Arlene Couchy, Partner for Business Development, and Sarah Marsh, Director of Channel Enablement, all with Verizon. Uh, folks, if our audience wants to get in contact with any of you, uh, they want to learn a little bit more about uh, Verizon's competition strategy, or they just want more resources, more advice, uh, any suggestions on where we should point them? Hit us up on LinkedIn, I think is a great place you can go and find us. We're there. And then um, I'm sure Sarah is going to point you to our uh, Verizon site as well. Absolutely. I was going to say LinkedIn too. Definitely connect with us. Uh, would love to continue the conversation. And then check out the Verizon Partner Network uh, website, which is um, attached to the verizon.com slash business site. And that's actually where all the podcasts are housed as well. All right, y'all. Thank you so much, David, Sarah, Arlene. It's really been a pleasure and I'm looking forward to chatting again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening to another episode of the podcast brought to you by Verizon Business. You can learn more about the Verizon Partner Network uh, or about all of our services that uh, Verizon has to offer on our website, verizon.com. Uh, for the uh, business side of our business, you can go to verizon.com slash business. Uh, and there you'll also be able to learn more about our channel partners. And like uh, Sarah said, you can also learn more about our content and listen to previous episodes of the show. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B, and we'll catch you on the next episode of the podcast. Thank you.